QuickBooks Online 2024 Navigation Overview and Company Settings. Get ready and some coffee because we're diving into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Online 2024. Here we are online in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file that we set up in a prior presentation. Remembering that when we are in our actual company file, represented by this company file here, it might still be useful to have open at the same time the QuickBooks Online test file so that we can use it as a sandbox testing out transactions in it before we put them into our actual company file. That leads to the question then, how can I open the QuickBooks Online test drive file at the same time that we have open our actual company file. The first thought that would come to mind would be, well, I'll just add a new tab here and then we'll search for the QuickBooks Online test drive. However, sometimes QuickBooks could have a problem with that because then we would have two company files that are open in the same browser, possibly using the same account. So an easier way to go might be then to either open another browser, we're currently in or I am in. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't wanna be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com, the uh, Google Chrome. So we could open something like Firefox or we can open up the incognito window. So the incognito window in Google Chrome can be found with the three dots up top most other browsers have some form of incognito window that you can find as well. And then we can open a new uh, incognito window. And you can see here that it says incognito. And then we can type in our QuickBooks Online test drive. So this is the easiest way I think to find it. Searching for QuickBooks Online test drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. Here's the test drive. And then we can go into the United States version of it and verify that we're not a robot. And so I'm going to continue. I'm going to close up this first tab. And by doing that, I can actually have these two things open at the same time. Here's the sample company file representing our actual file. Here's the test drive file, also a sample company file, but this is the Craig Designs and Landscaping. This file already has stuff in it. It already has reports generated. It already has a chart of accounts that is inactive and is being used. Whereas this file has just been created from scratch, doesn't have anything in it. So if you're imagining that you're actually using your company file and you have transactions that you're not fully comfortable with, you might have this one open, test out the transaction over here before you actually put it into your company file. Noting that if you try to open this up in the same browser, then again, you could have problems with it. The, the idea of the incognito or separate browser would be 
you don't have the cookies in it already. So QuickBooks is not going to try to open it with your actual account. It's going to be opened with the default, uh, basically, account and hopefully not cause you any problems to have both windows open at the same time. So for now, I'm going to put that in another screen. That's just a tool that you want to be aware of all the time. Last time we set up this company file from scratch, so there's nothing in it. We haven't done any data input. We haven't adjusted the chart of accounts as of yet. We haven't entered any items, inventory or service items, customers or vendors, or any beginning balances. When you first set up the file, QuickBooks will often give you this checklist here, which can be useful, but over time, this homepage that you first open is one of the most changeable things that QuickBooks Online has. Meaning uh, QuickBooks Online, because it's a web-based software, will vary the look and feel of the page a lot, a lot more than QuickBooks Desktop, which can be good because in theory, they're trying to maximize the look and feel of the website interface for users. However, in practice, I think most likely you have different developers that basically are, even if you have the optimal output or the optimal website, they would still change it because that's what developers do. So the website's probably gonna be changing all the time. However, the use of the software will be in essence the same because it's simply the double entry accounting system. So we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through uh, the checklist here. We're just gonna go through basically the setup process, which, which would probably be the same no matter what kind of the, the, the checklist that they give you. So uh, let's just do a quick look at these those. So here's the basic business uh, information. You covered all your basics. This helps you, you get through there, get ready to invoice. So this is gonna be your invoicing process. They're probably gonna try to upsell you on uh, using the QuickBooks checking so you can you can pay through the checking, which we have another course or section on. You will recall that we had some of these items in the setup process as we went through the interview process, in essence, with the setup, get paid online. So this is one of those things where they're trying to have you use uh, possibly the, the QuickBooks payments, again, to get paid faster, but it might be an upsell type of situation. We have another course or section on that if you wanna look at it in more detail. Uh, organize expenses, start tracking your expenses, uh, link business accounts. So this is the bank feeds. We'll talk about the bank feeds. We have a whole course or section on that. Payroll has its own area uh, to set up. So we'll talk about that a little bit here in future presentations. With this practice problem, we have whole other course or sections in payroll because it's its own, it's its own animal. It's got its own uh, stuff, which is quite detailed. Uh, get the free mobile app. And so this is their mobile app to snap and scan receipts that we also saw through the interview process. So we can get into those items here. We can also get into these items through other areas as well. So if you don't use this checklist, that's okay. We can get to all, we could turn on the bank feeds by going to the banking section and we can do all these things from other locations as well. Now, the other big thing that has changed over time is that they've been changing this ribbon on the left-hand side. And uh, uh, classically, it's looked like this. This is kind of similar to what it started with at the beginning. And then some developers, I think, were thinking it would be nice to move away from the idea of formal accounting language and try to appeal to people, possibly that are small businesses that, that, that want a more casual kind of interface on the left-hand side. Uh, I think there's pros and cons to that, however, because it sound, it starts to sound a little bit like uh, like accountants that use the formal language might not like that, meaning they, they might feel like they're not very appreciated that you're kind of using very, you know, the casual terms. So I think they actually left that because most of the people using QuickBooks are probably accountants and bookkeepers who have learned these professional terms, right? So what I mean is if we go to this cog up top, we have the switch to the business view down here. Now, if I switch to this business view and I look at this, this screen on the left, switching to the business view, we no longer have a huge difference between the business view and the accountant view. Before they changed things like, like the sales area here, uh, which I might call a customer center or something like that. They changed it to get paid or something like that. And they, they, this, they changed this one to pay out or, or pay someone out or something. And so they changed these terms to really 
casual terms. They had a pretty interesting interface over here once you went into those windows. But I think those those terms, they did an A-B testing. They had the two these two formats. And it looks to me like the more traditional format won out between their A-B testing. So now, even though they have both the switching still between the accountant view and the business view, there's not a big difference between the two. And it looks to me like now they've gone back to the accountant view being the default. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to assume that's going to be the, what they're going to do going forward because it looks like that's the, that's where they are going. That's why we update the, the course from time to time because that's one of the things that will change. They'll change the look and feel of the website. The other view was fine. You could find all the same stuff was in it. They just they just formatted it a little differently and tried to make it, you know, casual language, which might actually make it more difficult in some ways, you would think, because the formal language often has a reason <laughs> that it's formal because it's it's trying to really identify what exactly you're doing. But in any case, so we're gonna be in the accountant view. We're not gonna be switching back to the business view too much because it looks like the accountant view is basically the default that they're going back to at this point in time. Now, a quick review on the basic screen formatting. You have the center of the screen here, which is this display screen. So the first time we open the QuickBooks, this display screen will be the dashboard oftentimes. And it's kind of funny because the dashboard is like the least used thing oftentimes. You're probably not gonna use maybe the dashboard to go to a lot of places in part because they keep changing the dashboard. So, so we don't really know what's gonna pop up here. It's kind of a mystery. It's kind of like a, a surprise every time you open up QuickBooks to see what their dashboard's gonna look like. So what you typically will use for navigations are gonna be the new button up top, the uh, navigation that are side drops, what you might call them, the bar on the left-hand side, and then this icon up top for the cog and possibly your icon over here, but mainly the cog item. And then the thing that you go into will be displayed in the middle. Now, because this is an online software, we can also adjust the screen by zooming in. If I'm on, I'm on a Windows machine here, the easiest way to do it here is to go hold down control, scroll up on your mouse wheel, and you can see that the size of the screen changes. So this is 200% of the screen. So that is great because if you wanna get larger text or anything like that, you can easily zoom into the screen because it's a web-based software. However, it also causes problems, this screen being dynamic like this, changing as you zoom in, because that means the icons will actually change. You can see this icons have changed up top because now I have zoomed in. Therefore, if you're working on a, on a non-standard size screen, then it's likely that your icons will be slightly different due to the web page trying to maximize the screen size for for optimal use given your interface right so so if you don't see all the icons that i see you might scroll out of the screen to see if you can see it so for example all web-based softwares are designed to work on tablets now and phones. Tablets and phones are going to have a different size screen and therefore the layout of the screen is going to look a little bit different and you can and you can fix that or you can possibly find what is there by zooming in and out of the screen which will typically give you less options when you zoom in. There's going to be less things up top and more in like a drop-down format and then when you zoom out it's gonna give you more options in terms of the headers uh, up top is the general idea. Also note that if you're zooming into a, a form, if you open like an invoice and you zoom into the form, it works pretty, pretty well. There's different formats of the invoice now and we'll talk about that more as well. But if you zoom into the invoice, then uh, then that's nice because, because it gives you more detail, but when you start to populate the invoice and then add it, sometimes being too zoomed in could have a problem or, or cause issues with the data input. Therefore, if that happens, you just zoom back out, zoom back out again to 100% and then do the data input again. QuickBooks has gotten a lot better at that. So if you are entering a data input form while zoomed in, it usually works pretty well right now, but 
if for whatever re reason it glitches up, it might be because you're zoomed in too far and that caused an issue with the with the website. So just stop it, c cancel possibly, go back in and then enter it at 100%. The next thing to note is that you might wanna have multiple windows open, such as the reports. You might wanna have your reports. We will do this every time. We'll open up the balance sheet and the income statement, not until we actually have something in them, but once we start to build the balance sheet and the income statement, we will open them up every time in another tab so that we can have three things open. We can look at the data input, we can see the reports. There's a couple ways that you can open new tabs. What you can do is you could actually right click oftentimes on the link you want to open and then open link in a new tab like this. That's great, because and then you can see it populating in the new tab up top or you can right click on the tab up top and duplicate the tab. I'm not gonna add a new tab, I'm gonna duplicate the tab and then possibly look for whatever you wanna open within it, such as the reports on the left-hand side and then the profit and loss in this case, otherwise known as the income statement. Now, so that can take a little bit getting used to if you're used to web-based software, I'm sorry, desktop software like a, a QuickBooks desktop and part of the thing that needs to be getting used to is that you'd have to make sure you refresh or run the report every time you do data input. Because although the, this is on one website, if you do the data input over here, invoices, checks, and so on, then this side of the screen, this other tab might not pick it up until you actually run the report again. So you have to remember every time you go from, from one tab to the other, run the report. And if that doesn't work, you refresh the entire screen up top. But typically, if you're looking at reports, which is usually what we use this for, you can just refresh the report and it will work and you don't have to refresh the entire uh, page here. Let's go back to the first tab. Now, when we, when we do the actual data input, then the general layout is gonna be, if I'm working on something that is a day-to-data -data transaction, meaning, these are things that happen on a cyclical cyclical basis. They're normal transactions. Normally they will be up here in the plus button. The accounting system is cyclical, right? It repeats typically on a month by month basis. And within this accounting cycle, there are smaller cycles or different timing cycles that repeat such, and we can break them down into the customer or you can call it sales cycle, revenue cycle, accounts receivable cycle vendor cycle, otherwise known as expense cycle, purchases cycles, uh, you can call it, or a, a payable cycle, and then employee cycle, otherwise known as like the payroll cycle. And these three cycles will be more or less complex depending on the type of industry you are in, the industry often requiring more advanced or less advanced things, such as an accrual basis on the customer side, invoices, and bills versus a cash basis uh, being on the customer side, you would have the sales receipts or possibly using a deposit form versus on the vendor side, you would be a cash base using expense or check forms. And payroll is an accrual thing if you're running it within QuickBooks. If you have payroll outside of QuickBooks by a third party vendor, you might be able to use more of a cash based system. We'll talk more about that uh, in a future presentation. So, so that's the general idea there. Now, once you do the data input of these forms, then you also have to track your communication with the people we're doing business with as a bookkeeper, meaning customers, vendors, and employees. How do we do that? We go into what I would call the centers over here, like the sales center is what I might used to be called in the old version, the customer center, and we can manage and track our customer information, for example. And so we'd have our customers over here. On the expenses on our vendor side, expenses, which I might call the vendor center. I still call it that because that's it, there we have our vendors. And then on the payroll side, we have our, what I call our employee or payroll center uh, over here. And then we can process our payroll if we're doing payroll within the system. So that's the general navigation process. Now, when we're setting up the company file, we have to then do that one-time setup process that needs to be the foundation. Like if you're making a building, if you're building like a, a, a building or something like that, an office building or a house, the first thing you need to do is put down the foundation before you can have the cyclical things that would go on in the house, the day-to-day -day living or whatever, right? So how do you do that? Well, you'd have to then 
that's usually in the cog. So within the cog, we have our lists, which are going to be the fundamental kind of things that we need to set up. And we'll go over those in our setup process with our new company file, the main ones being the chart of accounts that we'll take a look at in more detail later. And then the products and services. Those are the main two lists that we would have to take a look at. Uh, and, and then you could, the other ones are important, but they're not like the foundational things, the payment methods, the terms, attachments, tags, if you're using them, custom fields, if you, if you need the custom fields and the recurring transactions. But the big ones, chart of accounts, products and services, those are the lists that once they're set up, you're not gonna be looking at them all the time. I'll go back to the desktop, although you, 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 you look at them occasionally, but, but those are the foundational items you need to set up first when you start a new uh, company file. So those are in the cog up top. Also in the cog are our company information, account settings and whatnot, and then uh, manage users and that kind of stuff. These are, the, these are the foundational type of items. So we'll talk more about the lists and these foundational items in future presentations. Right now, I just wanna look at uh, the account and settings. So let's go into this one because this was set up uh, when we when we did the interview kind of process. So we have the company information up top, the company name and so on and so forth. If I go into this, you could add a logo. I'll just add a quick logo here. I can add this and then add a logo. This logo might be something that you can use to populate on your invoices and stuff, for example. So I'll just add this guy as a logo and uh, obviously, you might want to look to see how you can optimize, you know, the size of the logo and, and make sure you have your professional logo. Company name showing on sales form and purchase orders connected to the business network. I'm going to say that's the same as the company name and then the EIN number. Notice that you're that you're this has got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a nine digit number. Now, if you're a sole proprietor, you might not have a company number. If you don't have any employees, the EIN number is called an employer identification number in the United States. If you don't have any employees, you might ask, why do I need an employer identification number? You may not, but if you're working with other businesses, like many small businesses do, then they're going to want to issue you a 1099. And if you don't have an EIN number, they're going to want your social security number, which one isn't secure because now you have to give them your personal number and two doesn't look as professional. So if you don't have an EIN number, you might want to get one, even if you're a sole proprietorship with no employees, pretty easy to do. Go into the IRS website and you can do it basically online at this point in time. I'm pretty, so you can check that out if you want to. So company type. So we set this up in the setup process. We said we were a sole proprietorship versus a partnership, limited liability company, small business, so on. We talked a little bit about the differences between uh, these items uh, at that time. So I won't go over it in detail here. We put our industry in place. So notice this is something that you can change if you didn't have it proper in the first setup process, noting that because you can change it, you can see that it doesn't really have an impact on the chart of accounts, which you would think would be the main impact when you first set up the company file. And then you've got the company email. The email might be important because you, that might be on the forms that we're gonna be putting uh, in place, such as the invoice form. Uh, customer facing email, we're gonna say it's the same. If you want a different one, you can uncheck that. The company phone number, I'm gonna say 999-99999. So that might be important because it might be on the forms as well. And this show on the sales form. So we might say this is website.com. So right, is whatever our website name, maybe it should be get great. So let's just put ggg.com. No, that doesn't work for some reason. Let's say website.com. So we'll save that. That might be on the forms, the address. So here's the address, address where your company is based. This could be important because if you do billing information, it might be necessary. If you have shipping information, then that might be the default. And with sales tax, the, the state that you're in and locale might be important as you set up your sales tax, which we'll take a look at later. So we set that up when we did our setup process. Uh, company address, what you entered, 
Yes, I'm going to say do. And then customer facing address. Notice this is the same. So I'm going to say, yep, keep it as the same legal address. I'm going to keep that as the same. If it were different, then of course you can change it there. So you have a different billing address possibly for the payments that you're making to QuickBooks versus your company address. You can change those, which might change things like what the sales tax is going to be calculated based on and what's going to be on the invoices. Communications with uh, Intuit down here, uh, you have your options on this side as well. So that's the general setup process. That's what has been put in place in essence. When we set up the company file, you can see a lot of this stuff was in basically that interview process. I'm going to close this back out. I'm going to say, do you want to leave without saving? I'll say, uh, I'll say, do I want to leave without saving? I think I saved it. So I'll save it and I'll say yes. And so that's the setup process that we have thus far. So going forward, then what we will do is we'll go back into this cog and we'll take a look at some more detail of some of the items in here, like uh, the users, for example, and and then we'll take a look at some of the lists and set those up. We'll set up our, our products and we'll set up our chart of accounts and then we'll enter our beginning balances. That'll be the first part of the course that we'll, we'll need to lay out. And then we can get into constructing our transactions using the forms and we'll do that from scratch. So as we do that, we'll see the creation of the financial statements, balance sheet, income statement and related reports as they're built from the base up from nothing on up and we'll see that uh, process and then we'll do you know bank reconciliations and we'll do period end uh, adjusting entries and we'll also track this information in the centers customer center or sales area vendor center expense center and the payroll centers to see how we might manage the communication with our our business affiliates, the vendors, customers, employees, as we go through our, our standard accounting cycle.